let's look at the thyroid gland. This is our study guide. And I hope that going through this lecture slide, we should be able to define the thyroid gland. We should also be able to describe where the location of the thyroid gland is, its functions, the structure in terms of growth and also histology, also the blood supply of the thyroid gland, then the innervation and some clinical anatomy. The thyroid gland is a butterfly-shaped structure that is located under the skin. It is seen in the neck region. This is the head. This is the neck part. So this is where the gland is located. It is located in the anterior part of the neck, and it weighs about 25 to 30 grams in harder. It is an endocrine type of gland. Because it is dotless, it does not have a dot, unlike the salivary gland that releases its secret through a dot, that's the salivary dot. But in terms of the thyroid gland, there is nothing of such. The secret of the thyroid gland is released directly into the bloodstream. So it does not have dots. So it is an endocrine type of gland, which tends to release their content directly into the blood. It is also highly vascularized. The thyroid gland has a lot of vessels that supplies blood to it. By the time we get to the blood supply region of this lecture, we would see the number of arteries that is able to give blood supply to the thyroid gland. And this can also be related to the fact that it is an endocrine type of gland because it releases what is secreted directly into the blood. So it needs to be richly supplied with blood so that the substance that the thyroid gland produces will be directly taken up by the blood capillaries. So where is this gland specifically located? The thyroid gland is located inferior to the thyroid cartilage, just around the region of the cricoid cartilage. Remember our lecture on the larynx, where we described the larynx being made up of the thyroid cartilage, the cricoid cartilage, and also the epiglottis. This is the thyroid cartilage, and this is the cricoid cartilage below it. It's located around the cricoid cartilage, just below the thyroid cartilage. You can see it where it is located, wrapped around the tree. Here. After the cricoid cartilage inferior to it, we have the C-ring cartilages that form the trachea. And you see the thyroid gland being wrapped around the trachea. It extends between C5 to T1 vertebral level. And of course, the position of these glands tends to change in respect to the activities that occur around the neck region. In terms of swallowing, the thyroid gland tends to move in respect to this activity. And this would be justified during the course of this lecture. What are the functions of this gland? The thyroid gland takes up iodine that is found in the food that we take. It converts them into thyroid hormone. These thyroid hormones are basically of two types. We have triiodothyronine and also tyrosine. The triiodothyronine is the T3 and it's about 20% of what the thyroid gland form from the iodine uptake, while tyrosine is T4 and is about 80% of what the iodine uptake from food is being able to produce. This occur by this process. We have the iodine that is being taken up in the food and this reacts with amino acid tyrosine, which finally produce the T4 and T3 thyroid hormones. So the basis of formation of the thyroid hormone is the absorption of iodine. So iodine is very important in the production of thyroid hormone. And of course, the thyroid gland does not just decide to initiate this reaction. This reaction is stimulated by a part in the brain, which is called the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland helps to stimulate the thyroid gland to secrete T3 and T4. And it does this by the release of the thyroid stimulating hormone. So the pituitary gland secretes thyroid stimulating hormone and the thyroid stimulating hormone then initiates the thyroid gland to secrete triiodothyronine and tyrosine. Furthermore, the functions of the thyroid gland, we already know that they produce or they secrete thyroid hormones, which include the T3 and T4 hormones. These are released directly into the bloodstream because we already said that they are endocrine type of gland. Whatever they produce is taken up by the blood. So they are transported into the blood. And this is the action that they tend to present within the body. The first one is that they help to control metabolic activities of the body. And one of the activities that they do in respect of metabolism is 
oxygen usage, they help to improve the usage of oxygen by the cell to break down food substances. They also help to enhance the process of glycolysis, which is the breakdown of glucose, and also lipolysis, which is the breakdown of lipids. Also, they help to secrete calcitonin. Calcitonin helps to reduce the amount of calcium in the bloodstream. When the system sees that the quantity of calcium in the blood is increased and it needs to be reduced, the thyroid gland tends to secrete calcitonin, which helps to reduce the amount of calcium that is in the blood. And how it does this is by suppressing the activity of the osteoclast, cells that are responsible for calcium regulation. So the activity is thereby suppressed so as to reduce the quantity of calcium seen in the bloodstream. Other functions that they do is bone and growth development. They also help to promote muscular function, cardiac output, and they help to enhance the formation of synapses and myelination so that stimulation are being adequately transmitted from one nerve to the other because they help to increase metabolic process and also help to stimulate growth and maturation. During pregnancy, the size of the thyroid gland is said to be increased so as to complement for the need of the developing fetus. The thyroid gland, we've said that it is located in the arterial region of the neck, it's wrapping around the trachea. This gland is enclosed by a membrane. When you go back to our lecture on the posterior triangle, we talked about the transverse section of the cervical region. We talked about the deep cervical fascia that is being further subdivided into prevertebral, the pretrachea, and also the investing layer. The pretrachea fascia, from the name, is a membrane that encloses the trachea and also the surrounding structure. So this is the trachea. This is the C-ring cartilage that forms the trachea. Then. Posterior to the trachea, we have the esophagus. Then on the lateral side, we have the carotid sheath, which encloses the internal jugular vein and also the common carotid artery. So this is the pre-trachea fascia because it encloses the trachea and the surrounding structure. So we have a fibrous sheath that is called the capsula glandulae thyroidae, which enclose the region of the thyroid gland. This fibrous membrane is further subdivided into two. We have an outer layer, which is a division of the pre-trachea fascia. Why deep to this outer layer? We have an inner layer that is also called the visceral layer. The unique thing about the inner layer is that they do not just run across the entire surface of the thyroid gland. They penetrate into the substance of the thyroid gland, thereby dividing them into lobes and lobes. The lobes of the thyroid gland. The thyroid gland is made up of three lobes. We have the right lobe, and this is the right lobe, and we also have the left lobe. The right and the left lobe is joined at the center by a region that is called the Xmos. Then we have the pyramidal lobe. The pyramidal lobe is the third lobe, and it's like a conical shape structure that originates from the upper part of the isthmus. This is not usually seen in whole subjects. It is not all individuals that have the pyramidal lobe. So this is the pyramidal lobe. Then the lobus, of course, the lobes are further subdivided into lobus. So this is histology. If you look at it under the microscope, all you see are the lobus. And the lobus are follicular cells around the fluid field cavity that's called the colloid. So this is the colloid at the center. Surrounding it is a single layer of epithelium, and these are called the follicular cells. Follicular cells have the capacity to form triiodotyronine and also the tyrosine. These are capillary network that are embedded within the follicles. So as soon as the follicular cell is able to produce the finished product, which is the T3 and T4 thyroid hormone, it is taken up by the capillary network directly into the blood and exhibits their actions. The thyroid gland is attached to the laryngeal skeletal system through ligaments, the anterior suspensory ligament. The anterior suspensory ligament connects the superior medial aspect of the thyroid gland. This is the right lobe, the left lobe, to the cricoid cartilage and also extend to the thyroid cartilage. So we have another anterior suspensory ligament on this other side, connecting the superior medial aspect of this lobe 
to the cricoid cartilage and also the thyroid cartilage. So it's in a way it has an anterior connection to the laryngeal skeleton. We also have the posterior suspense free ligament that is also referred to as the various ligament. This ligament connects the posterior media aspect at the back that's behind the thyroid thyroid gland, it connects it to the side of the cricoid cartilage. It also gives a connection point to the first and the second tracheal ring. So this is at the posterior part. So this is like a ligament that uh, creates a posterior connection of the thyroid gland to the laryngeal skeleton. So this firm attachment of this structure can be used to justify the fact that the thyroid gland is able to move during coughing because the thyroid gland is connected to the larynx and also the trachea. So any form of movement that the larynx or the trachea exhibit will also be impacted on the position of the thyroid gland because they will also move along with those structures because they are located and attached on them. The blood supply, we already said that the thyroid gland is richly supplied with blood. So it gets its blood from the superior thyroid artery, the inferior thyroid artery, and maybe the thyroid hema artery. This is a hack of aorta. We have the subclavian and we have the common carotid. On the right side, we have the brachiocephalic trunk, which further divides into the subclavian and also the common carotid. But for the common carotid that we're running upward along the neck, it divides into the internal carotid that runs into the cranium to supply the brain tissue, then the external carotid that supplies structures outside the neck and the head. From the external carotid artery, we have the superior thyroid artery and you can see it emerging from this region and descending down before it finally terminates around the superior part of the thyroid gland. We have the subclavian artery. The subclavian artery also gives off a number of branches. You can go and check up a lecture on the subclavian artery. One of the arteries that they give off is the tyrocervical trunk. This tyrocervical trunk then gives off the inferior thyroid artery that runs around the inferior region of the thyroid gland to supply that region. So they terminate, thereby forming anastomosis with the superior thyroid artery. We may have another contributory supply from the thyroid hema artery, which is not common. You don't get to see it in all individual tree. And this is the thyroid hema artery. And you see them terminating around the isthmus region of the thyroid gland. So they also help to connect with the superior and the inferior thyroid artery to, to form anastomosis, which helps to give a rich supply network to the thyroid gland. A bit more on the thyroid hematry. The thyroid hematry is a single or unpaired vessel that originates from different regions, reported to be seen in about three to 10% of population. And the various regions where they can possibly emerge from include the brachiocephalic trunk, the subclavian artery, the common carotid, and even from the hack of the hiatus. So these are the various regions where they could emerge from. And of course, they run through their normal route to be terminated on the isthmus region of the thyroid gland. The venous drainage occurs through three vessels, and this includes the superior thyroid vein, and this is the superior thyroid vein, and the middle thyroid vein, and this is the middle thyroid vein. The superior and the middle thyroid vein drain into the internal jugular vein, and this is the internal jugular vein, where the superior and the middle thyroid vein drain into. Then we have the last vein, which is the inferior thyroid vein. This is the inferior thyroid vein, and they drain directly into the brachiocephalic vein. This is the internal jugular vein that connects with the subclavian around this region to unite to become the brachiocephalic vein. The brachiocephalic vein will finally drain into the superior vena cava. This is the superior vena cava that also connects with the inferior vena cava that is coming from the inferior part of the body to form the vena cava. And vena cava finally drains into the right part of the heart, specifically the right atrium, which is the region of the heart that contains deoxygenated blood before the pulmonary artery will take it to the lungs for oxidation. The innervation of the thyroid gland occurs through the autonomic nervous system. And of course, the two subdivisions are the sympathetic and the parasympathetic innervation. For the sympathetic innervation, they occur from the superior, middle, and the inferior sympathetic cervical ganglion. Why the parasympathetic innervation of the thyroid gland is by the vagus nerve. The clinical anatomy, one of the abnormalities that we look into is the lingual thyroid, which means 
the thyroid gland that is located around the posterior part of the tongue, lingual means tongue. And this, of course, is a developmental abnormality. We know that the thyroid gland develops around the posterior part of the tongue before they descend or migrate to the anterior part of the neck. So when the descend refuse to occur, it means that the thyroid gland will then be placed where it originates from, which is behind the tongue. And this is called the lingual thyroid. It could also have an overactive thyroid gland, which means hyperthyroidism. It could occur as a result of Graves disease, which is an autoimmune disease that tends to increase the secretion of the thyroid hormone. Or adenomas. Adenomas are benign tumor seen within the thyroid gland, and this could also cause the thyroid gland to be overactive. There could also be an underactive thyroid gland, and this is termed hypothyroidism. We already know that the thyroid gland uses iodine to produce the thyroid hormone. So where there is deficiency of this iodine, there's going to be under production of the thyroid hormone, which will lead to an underactive thyroid gland or this genesis. This genesis is embryonic abnormality where the thyroid gland does not develop as it should. So there's going to be underactive thyroid gland also in this case. There could also be goiter. Goiter is a swelling of the thyroid gland presented with a swelling around the anterior part of the neck. This is as a result of iodine deficiency. When there is deficiency also in iodine, the thyroid gland will begin to overwork itself, thereby increasing in size. We can check our understanding of this lecture through the following. The first one is to describe the anatomy of the thyroid gland. At least the functions of the thyroid gland. What functions do they present in the body? explain the blood supply of the thyroid gland. We've described that the thyroid gland is richly supplied with blood. So thanks for your time. Let's continue to stay tuned for more updates. Thank you. Bye.